Yes, I'm going to speak about the use of architecture within these uh, uh, houses uh, in Iron Age Denmark. Excavations of Iron Age houses in Denmark can be divided into two regions. The first being characterized by large scale excavations with substantial numbers of post holes and, and house plans. While the second includes settlement mounds with preserved cultural layers, floors, pavement, pavements, and other aspects of the interior design <coughs> of the farm. The well preserved houses are mainly located in, in the Lingfjord area in the northern parts of Jutland. These differences between the, to the two groups should be explained by two factors long lived settlement continuity in the northern parts, as well as the use of turf as building material forming these artificial settlement mounds. These excavations of settlement mounds not only offer more detailed insights into the architecture of the houses, but also allow us to raise questions of how differences in the construction can be included in socio-political and ideological terms. The main issues addressed in this presentation are therefore how can we recognize ideological masses in the architecture? And in what way did the ideology affect the architecture and the interior design of the Iron Age houses? The, the Iron Age house in Denmark belongs to a long-lived tradition starting in the early Bronze Age and which, well, with minor variations, lasts until the end of the Viking Age. The houses are three ailed timber-built longhouses orientated east-west, and in the early Iron Age, as I will speak about, from the period 500 BC to 280, these houses are typically uh, 5 meters wide, 12 to 20 meters long, and the western part of the house contains the living area, while the eastern part is the able. The houses have one fireplace and two entrances, that are placed in the middle of the house, one facing to the north and the other facing south. The southern being the main entrance with the largest and finest stone pavement, while the northern entrance should be categorized as the back entrance. These characteristics apply to most of the houses from the early Iron Age. Some of the largest longhouses could be interpreted as chieftain's farms but the common interpretation is that each longhouse should be considered <laughs> as a separate and self-sufficient household. In 2000 and 2001, <coughs> the Historical Museum of Northern Jutland excavated the eastern half of the settlement mound at Nørtanas. The oldest houses date to the transition between the Bronze and Iron Age, while the youngest uh, phase belongs to the early Roman period. The village thereby showed a continuity of 600 years and more than 150 longhouses were excavated. So at the end of the, uh, of the lifespan of the village, more than 15 contemporary farms existed. So this uh, enabling us to make detailed ana analysis of the socio-ideological hierarchies within the settlement. The houses were mostly well preserved with chalk floors, herds, remains of walls, and included a large amount of pottery and bone. One of the farms were burned with uh, the livestock, and also five people died within, within the flames. And the excavation of this house gave uh, an incredible insight into how an Iron Age uh, farm, and especially the stable, were organized. This uh, farm was presented at the EAA meeting in Glasgow last year, so I won't go into details about this. So this is just representation of uh, which animals were kept in, in the stable. During the first 400 years of the site, the longhouses mostly show differences in the length of the houses and a change in building customs. At one point, the use of turf as building material is introduced, but the overall typo typology is not challenged. 
the alignment of the houses and the interior design of the houses are more or less the same. But at the end of the pre-Roman Iron Age, a division of the village is more obvious. The longhouses can be divided into two groups, smaller longhouses with four sets of roof-bearing posts and regular longhouses with six sets of posts. The smaller type make up seven longhouses, uh, while uh, 21 houses belong to, to the larger type. Some of the smaller longhouses depart from the norm and thereby show a wide-ranging break within the architectural tradition. Some of the smaller longhouses are characterized by only one entrance, and in some cases this only remaining entrance is placed to the north, which usually should be regarded as the back entrance. The smaller longhouses also have stables, but these are often positioned in the western part of the longhouse. In rare cases, the alignment of the smaller houses are north-south. North, south. So, how should, we, uh, how should these differences be explained? Should it be by functionality or economically reasons? Or rather, as a deliberate discriminator in a social or ideological context? So actually, who decides the design of the longhouse? Is it the specific household or is it the community? These architectural differences might seem insignificant, but nevertheless, they are a result of a deliberate use of architecture in altering the interior design. The alignment of one of the houses, uh, this one, um, it's north-south, and the only entrance is facing to the east. So like the other smaller houses with stable in the incorrect partition, uh, the stable is placed to the left and not to the right when you enter the door. Could the, the reason for these changes be to set the individual households from other households? So, how should we explain the smaller farms at Nertanus in the late pre Roman Iron Age? Should it be different economies, perhaps? settled by fishermen or part-time farmers. And in this connection, I should say that, uh, that the Limfjord, where access to, to uh, fish lies about three or four kilometers away. So I don't think this should be the obvious uh, explanation. It could also be newly established households, perhaps uh, waiting for a proper farm to, to get by inheritance. Or it could be old farmers that were well, relief from duty, so to speak. But, in my opinion, it's a, it shows a class of poor farmers with limited access to right to land. The analysis of the longhouses at Neurotonus indicates that the poorest farmers became even poorer during the last phases of the settlement. The short houses became smaller and the stables were placed uh, in the western part of the house. This could be explained as a sign of limited equalization in the society and the rise of a landless class or a class with limited access to land. It might be that this development gains further momentum at the end of the early Roman period, where the farms in other areas of Jutland show a significant increase in both the number and the sizes of buildings. So this process may have caused the advancement of settlements like uh, Neurotinus uh, because the small farms did not enable the extensive changes in spatial organization, leading to a larger household, including perhaps a landless class. Finally, it should be mentioned that these changes are contemporary, archaeologically speaking, with several changes within the material culture in, in Denmark. This means also the introduction of <coughs> weapon and Roman import as grape goods, and at the beginning of the Roman period, also information bureaus. So these changes occur at the same time when Roman influence in Northern uh, Europe increases. So, Another explanation should, could be that it's just innovators. 
of uh, these architectural changes could be a rebellion against the traditional and conservative society as seen in modern day Freetown of Christiania, Copenhagen. I don't think so, but uh, why not? <laughs> Thank you.